Hello, good morning, good afternoon to our audience joining us from various time zones. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, thank you for making the time to join us today for this latest webinar on uh, in our Yemen series. Uh, today's session uh, uh, will focus on peacemaking efforts uh, under successive UN special envoys for Yemen, uh, the current state of the conflict in the country, and recommendations for the incoming special envoy. Uh, with that, I'll briefly introduce today's panel of experts, uh, starting with uh, Nadwa Dausari, a non-resident fellow at uh, the Middle East Institute. Before joining MEI, um, she has uh, she had tw over 20 years of field uh, experience in Yemen, conducting extensive research and providing deeper insights into the internal dynamics of the conflict in the country. Um, I should mention that Nadwa has published a research paper uh, just a couple of days ago uh, with the Century Foundation that I think should be a required reading for all Yemen watchers. Uh, I will share that paper uh, in the chat here uh, with you all shortly. Uh, also with us today is uh, Maysa Shujaad-Din, uh, a non-resident uh, fellow at the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, her writing and analysis have been featured in many media outlets such as uh, Jadaliya, Safir al-Arabi, al-Arabi al-Jadid, and Al-Monitor. Uh, she holds a master's degree in Islamic studies from the American University of Cairo, uh, and she is joining us from Cairo as well. Uh, this is her first AGSIW program, so welcome, Maysa, and thank you again for uh, joining us. Uh, last but not least is uh, Peter Salisbury, a Crisis Group Senior Analyst for Yemen. He has more than a decade of wide-ranging experience as a, as a journalist with the Middle East Economic Digest, The Economist, Financial Times, Foreign Policy, and Vice News, among others. He has consulted to the UK's Department of International Development, the UN, and World Bank, and has published a series of highly regarded papers on Yemen for Chatham House, where he is also a Senior Consulting Fellow. Uh, moderating the session today is Gregory Johnson. Greg served on uh, the Yemen panel of experts for the UN Security Council from 2016 to 2018. Uh, currently, he is a non-resident fellow at the Center for Middle East uh, Policy at the Brookings uh -huh. Institution. He's also the editor of the Yemen, Yemen uh -huh. Review and a non-resident fellow at the Sana'a Center. Uh, he's uh -huh. the author of The Last Refuge, Yemen, Al-Qaeda, and America's War in Arabia, which has been translated uh -huh. into multiple languages. Uh, and with that, Greg, over to you. Thank you very much, Raymond, and, and welcome to everyone who's joining us online and, of course, to our, our three speakers. I'll just give you a bit of a, a rundown of what we're going to do today. Um, and we've divided the today's session basically into three equal parts. So we're going to start. Um, I'll ask each of our three panelists um, a particular question, which will allow them to make some opening remarks. There will probably be a follow-up or two from, from me. That'll go for the first half hour. Then there will be a discussion between the four of us for the next half hour. And then in the final third, um, we'd love to get questions from the audience. But I, I would just encourage everyone who's listening in, watching, not to wait until the end to provide your question, but rather as you go along, if something sparks your interest, if you have a question, to go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. I'll be following that. I'll be monitoring that. And then in the last um, half hour or maybe 40 minutes, um, I'll ask those of, of our different panelists. So please, I'll, I'll remind you periodically to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. Um, but we'd appreciate that. And I think it makes for a much more lively discussion um, if you all can participate and ask some of the things that are that are really pressing on, on your mind. Um, right now, I want to just sort of set the scene. Obviously, um, in Yemen, the war has been gone, going on for quite some time. The Houthis took over Sana'a in September of 2014. In March of 2015, Saudi Arabia um, launched a what they called Operation Decisive Storm, and the war has basically been going on since that point. The UN has had three different special envoys, none of whom have been particularly successful, or at least none of whom have been able to end the war. The last special envoy, Martin Griffiths, who's now leaving his job, the new special envoy, there's been some um, uh, some news coming out about who it is, although I don't believe the UN has put out an official statement um, on the new special envoy yet. Um, but one month ago today, Martin Griffiths gave what was his final briefing to the UN Security Council. And it was an incredibly bleak briefing. And I'll just read one quote to sort of get us started. And this is Martin Griffiths said, over the course of the conflict, armed and political actors have multiplied and fragmented. Foreign interference has grown, not diminished. What was possible in terms of conflict re resolution years ago is not possible today. And what is possible today 
may not be possible in the future. So I think what Griffiths was saying and what many of us know is that the conflict in Yemen is getting worse rather than better. So with that sort of pessimistic note to start us off on, I'm going to ask Nedwa a question and let her speak for a few minutes. So Nedwa, as Raymond mentioned, you have a paper that I think just came out yesterday called Fantasies of State Power Can't Solve Yemen's War. With that in mind, I'd like you to talk about what has gone wrong over the past five or six years with the UN's approach in Yemen. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, I, I want to say that uh, one important thing is that we should not um, expect the UN to solve Yemen problem. Um, I think it's... it's um, it's not realistic because there are huge forces, local and regional, uh, that are competing, that are beyond the UN's ability to control um, or sway. Um, so with that, I, I want to talk a little bit about the UN peace process and where it went wrong. I have only five minutes, so I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief. Um, so I think the main problem with the UN peace process is that it's too fixated on a, on a political settlement between the elite, between the Houthis and the Hadith government. Um, and in, in, in doing so, it's actually disconnected from the reality that has evolved over the past seven years. And in my report that was published yesterday, I talked about the different uh, hybrid and non-state actors that are in Yemen right now mainly focusing on the south and the west coast, which is more than two thirds of the, the, you know, the, size, the size of the country. Um, um, and these hybrid actors, um, they're in the south, they're, um, you know, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity um, referred to as uh, SDC forces, but they're not really SDC forces. They're affiliated with the SDC forces, but in reality, there are also tensions among these forces. Same thing in the West Coast. All these forces combined together have more control, more land um, and, and uh, strategic areas than the Houthis or Hadi government. And they are antagonistic to both. So when you do negotiations between two parties that have, that do not have much, well, legitimacy, but also, you know, presence on the ground, um, then you're, you're ignoring the reality on the ground. All these armed actors are not represented in the peace talks. Um, and there hasn't been any serious attempts to understand the dynamics within these armed actors, their interests um, and their um, you know, willingness to contribute to peace, however that will be. Um, but I think also lack of inclusivity is not the only problem with the UN peace process. I think it, the UN peace process fails to account for the power and military dynamics on the ground. Now, the non-state armed actors and hybrid actors are one component, but also one thing with, with the peace process that has been pushing for a ceasefire for years now, and it, it hasn't you know, materialized. Um, so while the UN and the international community successfully put pressure on Saudi and Hadi government sometimes and forced them to de-escalate several times, it, it cannot say the same thing about the Houthis. It has failed every time to exercise the same pressure on the Houthis. Um, and I think that's largely because the UN has leverage on Saudi Arabia and the coalition and Yemeni government, but it does not have the leverage on the Houthis. Um, so without leverage, really, uh, it, it's hard to, uh, you know, to do diplomacy um, without the leverage. Um, and in fact, I, I argue that the UN process has done more harm than good because it's not sensitive to the military reality on the ground. And I will give an example um, of the Stockholm Agreement. Now, I know I keep talking about the Stockholm Agreement and how it was flawed, but it is a turning point. Stockholm Agreement was a turning point in Yemen conflict because it stopped a major operation that would have taken the Hodeida seaport from the Houthis. And would, that would, in my opinion, that would have weakened the Houthis enough where they can, where they, they, they accept some, some concessions. They can give some concessions and, and that would kind of bring us closer to an agreement. Um, but so what happened was that in the Stockholm Agreement, 
the UN and the international community forced the Saudi the, the Saudi led coalition and Hadi government to stop the, the the military operation, but it did not exercise the same pressure on the Houthis. So what happened is that Houthis repositioned their forces and they um, they uh, they they captured um, substantial. They made substantial military gain in the in the east of Sanaa, and now they're threatening Marib, which is the last stronghold of, of, of the government. So, inadvertently, the UN peace process helped the Houthis militarily. Um, I know it was not the intention, but it happened. Um, and a lot of Yemenis warned against that, but um, the UN didn't listen. Um, well, now we have the Houthis who have the upper hand militarily. You know, given the fact that they they and the Yemeni government, in comparison to, compared to the Yemeni government, because the, both sides are, you know, in the negotiations, um, the Houthis define the war as one between them and Saudi Arabia. Uh, they consider themselves as the only representatives of Yemenis, and they don't they don't recognize other actors. Um, their position is clear and well articulated by their leaders. Saudi coalition leaves unconditionally, and you know they have a free hand in Yemen. Um, and no one has leverage on the Houthis. And so again, diplomacy without leverage does not work. So, so I think, you know, I think in my opinion, the, the UN process is, is very limited in, in terms of what it can do given the, the power dynamics um, and the competing regional and local, you know, agendas. Um, and so again, I think it's, it's important that we, we kind of, we, we don't have high expectation of the coming UN envoy or the UN peace process. Thank you. Ned, well, let me follow up just briefly with one of the things that you said. So I think the, the, the point that you made about the international community and the UN's lack of leverage with the Houthis is really key. And I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But you also mentioned, and I think this has been obvious, and even in the quote that I read from Martin Griffiths, he talked about this as well, that what started as sort of a two point party conflict with the Houthis and the Hadis government has fractured. The STC has, obviously, the STC didn't exist when the war started. They now exist. They're, they're a major factor. Tariq Saleh and his, his uncle, the late former president Ali Abdullah Saleh, were allied with the Houthis, the longer allied with the Houthis. Tariq Saleh has established a political bureau. He recently traveled to Moscow for talks. So my question is, if the two-party talks aren't going to work with the UN, how many parties does the U.S. UN need to bring in in order to get a, a critical mass of groups? Is this something where, you know, four party talks with the Hadi government, the SDC, the Houthis and Tariq Saleh would work? Or do you need to bring in all of these different hybrid and local actors? How many seats at the table are, are necessary in order to get some sort of a deal or the beginnings of a deal done? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think all these hybrid actors should be on the ta- around the table. Um, and I think w- with these hybrid actors, it's important first to understand who they are, what are their interests, what are, what are, what are they willing to do or not do, um, you know. Um, and so I think it's important for the UN envoy to understand these actors, um, to... Um, engage them in, in one way or another. Um, again, it doesn't have to be around the main table, but they have to be recognized and they have to be acknowledged and they, their, their interests have to be um, analyzed. And based on that, um, you know, uh, the UN can decide how they can be engaged um, in the negotiations itself. Um, I'm not sure how many parties should be around the, t- the table. I think there are ways to, you know, include some of the parties under Hadi's government, uh, particularly the parties that are not hostile to Hadi's government. Um, uh, and I'm in no position to, you know, decide on behalf of the parties, but I think that requires the UN envoy to reach out to these parties and can assess, you know, their willingness to engage um, and in what formula. Thanks. That, that's helpful. And I think we'll build on that in our discussion as we go forward. I'm going to turn to, to Mesa right now and give her a chance to, to talk. And, and Mesa, the question I wanted to ask you is, how has Yemen changed since 2014 when the Houthis took control over Sana'a? Basically, what is the situation on the ground that the new UN special envoy is going to be dealing with? And what are the challenges that he'll have to face because of this changing situation? 
Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Um, about 2014, when the Houthis uh, took over Sana'a, um, I believe it was the end of the Yemeni state that was established in 1994 after, uh, after the defeat of the Socialist Party in the South and when Ali Abdullah Saleh established his state on all of Yemen at that time in 1994. I believe that uh, when they signed an agreement with the Houthis at that time, uh, the government recognized and legitimized uh, the right of the militia to force uh, their rights or their determination according to, due to their weapons. So they put an end to the political process, to the whole political process that was started in the, after the GCC when the, it was signed in February 2012. So I think um, the government at that time delegitimized itself. Uh, the political process has, uh, has been ended at that time. And the situation uh, and the, the UN envoy at that time, he did not recognize or he did not uh, recognize this massive or this radical change this radical transformation, and he keep dealing, striking deals between the two parties as if we are dealing with two, as if it's the same situation of 2011 at that time. Um, then when we move to the war in 2015, actually I believe that the mistake and the change, the big change has been happened after the um, failure of the Kuwait negotiation in 2016, in August 2016. Because during this negotiation in Kuwait, we still talk about a state, a Yemen state, a united Yemen state, about that in the government, about that government at this foot is still recognized at that time, the government. And they are still dealing with, with the situation as a temporary situation. But when they formed the government and when they agreed with Ali Abdullah Saleh to form the government at that time, they start to deal with the war as a, as a permanent situation. So they start to behave as a state at that time. Since 2016 until now, the Houthis has become a state, not only a conflicting party, actually. And it's very difficult to ask the Houthis to abandon this state and share the power with, our, with others. What is the incentive at that time? What is the motivation? What can tempt the Houthis to agree or to abandon part of their power to share with the power with others? They have now their state. They, have, they inherited the state institutions. They inherited the army. They inherited the security the security institutions and they inherited also and they are controlling the biggest part of the population they collect taxes equal to the taxes that Ali Abdullah Saleh collected in much less population with difficult circumstances in the war during this war and they have other uh, economic, uh, economic economic incomes from at Zakah from and they are and they have the Jbaya levels from all the time they are collecting taxes so I don't think that the Houthis they are willing uh, to do a deal to make a deal with anyone this is first and we don't we should not exaggerate uh, the, the, uh, the UN the strength of the UN or anything or their, his capability to do any deal if there is a lack of um, the political will of the conflicting parties, especially an essential conflicting conflict party who is the Houthi. Uh, so I think if we could not address the main obstacle of this war, of, this, of the peace, which is that, that we have now an economy, a war economy, and the Houthis, they are benefiting from this war economy. How we can debrief them from this economic resources without risking the humanitarian situation in their areas? I think this is a big dilemma that it's very difficult to be addressed. So I'm not very optimistic at all, 
because I believe that the Houthis, they are establishing their state, their own state. They are start to st spread their ideology. They start to change the curriculum. They already, they are changing everything in this state. And they have now a big network of th thousands of individuals of their supervisor networks who are running the Yemen state now or the, their, the Yemen state on their areas now. So how we can dissolve it, all of this, how we can dismantle all of this. And Abdel Malik al Houthi is enjoying an, an absolute power now. So I don't think it's easy, and it's not easy also to divide Yemen because now the fragmentation of the Yemeni state has become a fact that we can't, that we can't ignore. So I don't think his mission is an easy mission. Uh, I believe that every UN envoy came to Yemen, he reached to his mis mission, and the situation has become more complicated. When Ben Omar left, the situation has become much more complicated when uh, came Ben Sheikh Jamal Ismail with Sheikh. And the same situation now, now Merton Griffith is, is, left, is leaving his position. And now the situation has become much, much more complicated, more conflicting parties, more fragmentation, and the Houthis power has become much stronger than ever. Mesa, let me follow up because I think you made some great points there, particularly on the Houthis since 2014, basically establishing a state. I mean, we've seen, as you talked about, the Houthis inheriting the military. We've seen them basically restructure the intelligence um, organization, the intelligence apparatus in Sana'a. We've seen them institute things like supervisors in ministries. They're running cultural courses. I think it was in October of 2019 for the first time we saw something like Ashura being celebrated in Yemen. Um, we've seen them change um, the educational texts that are being used in schools. Uh, we also see, and I think this is very important, the change in the currency. So the Yemeni real is trading at just over a thousand in Aden, where it's trading at, at 597 in Sana'a. And so in many ways, Yemen does, like you, as you spoke, it, it, it seems as if fractured and fragmented to the point that it's at least two different states, at least functionally. And so my question is, given that reality, is it possible it, in the event that some sort of an agreement between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis were constructed, is there enough opposition within Houthi controlled territories in Yemen, whether it's tribal opposition or other opposition that could force the Houthis, if, if they were to make some sort of an arrangement with Saudi Arabia, a bilateral arrangement that could then force them to negotiate with the Yemeni state, with the other actors that, that Nedwa has talked about. Is there enough local opposition to, to move the needle or is Abdul Malik so in control at this point after basically six years that the Houthi state is a, is a de facto state at this point? I believe the Houthis created a lot of enemies in a very short time. Also, the people who benefit from their corruption is much less than uh, the people who benefit from the corruption during Saleh era. I mean, the corruption network during Saleh era was massive and many people benefit from it, even the small officers in the government. But with the Houthis, even the corruption didn't feed everyone as it was the case during Saleh era. So they are relying to, on violence mainly in dealing with the society. And they are relying on another important factor, which is the legitimacy that has been granted to them because of that Saudi intervention. So since the Saudi intervention is continuing in Yemen, I don't think there is an opposition could be established against the Houthi. There is, could be a serious opposition against them. This is part, and also another part that the Houthi violence make the people afraid, and it's very difficult to organize any kind of opposition movement against them. It's not the same case during Saleh era when there was a space of freedom. So there is a kind of NGOs and political parties, they can organize themselves, they can do some activities against the government. So, this can be happened in, during the Salah era, but with the Houthis, because they are afraid a lot from the street, because they came from the street and they are aware how the street demolished the power of Ali Abdullah Saleh. 
So they are trying all, always, and their intelligence, that to, to spy on the people and to know and to oppress any kind of movement even before it starts. So I don't think there is any kind of opposition, a serious opposition can be established against the Houthi, especially that the alternatives are much worse. When they saw, when the people in the Houthi areas see the situation in Adan, they feel, okay, the situation in Sana'a is much better. So I don't think if there is no alternative, if that Saudi intervention continued, uh, also all of this, reasons, I don't think that, that could, there is an opposition to be happened against the Houthis. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, there's a couple of things that I think will follow up in our broader discussion in, in just a moment, including some of the questions from the Q&A um, box, which I think touch on some of what you said, Mesa. And I would encourage, again, everybody who's listening in um, to go ahead and, and keep putting your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll be going through those um, throughout our discussion. But right now, let me turn to, to Peter. Um, Peter, we've talked about some of the failures of the UN with Nedwa. We've talked about some of the changing realities on the ground with Mesa. Now, I want you to sort of build on that. And given the current situation on the ground, is a UN brokered peace even possible? And if so, what would that look like? Sure, that, that's a good question. I think the really important question there is what, what would peace look like? And I think that, I mean, as everyone has mentioned so far, the paper that Nedwa published with the, the Century Foundation yesterday is a really excellent, not even primer, but, but in-depth look into this question of military, political and governance realities on the ground, which is that Yemen has fractured into a series of almost mini states, um, over the course of the, the past six years, drawn down actually sort of fairly predictable political geographic lines. We have this profusion of armed groups, political groups, and groups that are, are trying to establish themselves as governance actors. And the Houthis are the most powerful group among these. And since the beginning of the war, as, as Maisa says, um, the UN has been trying to broker and Nadwa says the UN has been trying to broker a, a deal between the Houthis, who are the most powerful actor on the ground, and a government which is still kind of a holding vehicle for international state legitimacy. And I think the aspirations of many Yemenis who would like to see a, a civil state, a democratic state in the future, but which has stopped functioning really as a meaningful governance actor on, on the ground. And that means we need to rethink this question of what peace is. In 2015, 2016, the framework was get the, the quote unquote two parties, the then Houthi Saleh Alliance and the internationally recognized government in a room together, work out a power sharing agreement, get everyone back to Sana'a and carry on with the, the political transition that was underway between 2012 and 2014. I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that, I mean, one, that's probably just not going to happen. The incentives aren't there for the, the parties to make that kind of deal. And two, a unity government formed of, of these two components could actually be pretty disastrous and would probably just spark a new and different round of, of conflict. First, the Houthis are the stronger party. So what we'd really be talking about would be the absorption of the, the major sort of internationally recognized players into the, the authorities in Sana'a, which are institutionally pretty, pretty threadbare, but still sort of the, the strongest institutional actors and their, their security systems. And they would then more than likely attempt to re-centralize governance functions in Sana'a, in effect sort of achieving through politics what, what they haven't been able to do militarily up until now, and the result of that would be predictable. We'd see people at the local level fighting back. So first, yes, the UN needs to work with as many parties as it possibly can, and not just armed actors, civil society, women's groups, kind of pro-peace groups, if, if you like, but it also needs to think about and begin to articulate a vision for a political process 
and ultimately for peace that deals with these realities. Because as long as the idea is this two-party framework, unity to government in Sana'a plus ceasefire, I have a very strong feeling that there'll be extreme internal resistance um, to, to such an idea. And it would be the perfect excuse in many ways for the Houthis to continue um, with the military aspects of the conflict and for the government to, to prolong um, the, the, the period of, of delay before we move towards political negotiations, which I think many in the Hadi camp recognize now um, would, would spell the beginning of the end for, for Hadi and his inner circle. And in, in fact, sort of when we were doing research for a paper that we published last year, someone in the government camp described uh, an attempt under current circumstances to do a deal between the Houthis and the government as a suicide pact for the, the government camp. So I think that one, again, we need a much more wide ranging approach. And two, we need for whoever the new envoy is to articulate a vision less for peace, but more for the political process that accounts for all these factors and doesn't rush to a quick solution that maybe suits the interests of international players, but likely just sparks a new and bloodier round of, of conflict. Thanks, Peter. There's a lot there and two things I want to follow up and then I'll open it up to, to everyone. Um, and we're going to talk about sort of incentives and leverage with regards to the Houthis. But I think you made a really interesting point with Hadi and the idea that if Hadi is to negotiate and really negotiate, that it would essentially spell the end of Hadi's um, time and power. And of course, Hattie is someone who is only supposed to be a transitional president, was only supposed to last till February of 2014. His, um, his, his term was then extended for one year before that happened. He was placed under house arrest, resigned under pressure, fled to Aden, then to Saudi Arabia, um, renounced his resignation, and, and has since been the internationally recognized president that everyone sort of agrees is, is at least nominally in charge. So when we talk about um, leverage over the Houthis, I think that's one thing. But how do you convince someone like President Hadi to negotiate in good faith, to work for something that's for the good of the country long term, when it would spell the end of his time in power short term? And we've seen, as I think everybody's aware, we've seen this before in, in early 2016, President Hadi named Ali Musa al ahmar as his vice president, likely as a, a move to sort of derail the peace talks in, in Kuwait. So this is not a new thing, but how does the international com community, the UN special envoy or the US special envoy for that matter, convince Hadi to do something that's working against his own narrow personal interests? Sure. So I, I'd say that this is where the idea of a more inclusive UN-led led process could change the, the game. And the, the way that I sometimes explain the situation in Yemen to people right now is that we're, we're all in a casino and we've got a blackjack table to the left and we've got a poker table to the right. And the blackjack table, there are only two players and there's a dealer. And that's the Hadi government and that's the, the Houthis. And the Hadi government, regardless how it plays, is always going to be given more chips. And the Houthis, meanwhile, have a seat at the poker table where all the military players are on the ground and they've got the biggest chip pile and that sustains their process, their, their presence on the, the blackjack table. And we end up with this unending process where Hadi is never going to leave the blackjack table. And as long as the Houthis do really, really well at poker, they can stay in that game too. And the UN is there dealing the cards, hoping that at some point they'll take their chips and go, go away. I apologize if that's a horrible mangled metaphor. But the, the point I, I make here is we need to merge those two games if we want to have incentives for deal making. And something really interesting, I think, in, in Yemen in general is people think of it as a very fractious country. But when I think of Yemeni politics, I think about coalition building. I think about the way that different parties will often sort of turn almost on a dime and decide that it's in their interest to work with their, their rivals. And that often creates these incredible political shifts that we've seen over the years and the collapse of coalitions. So 2011, we saw really the collapse of the status quo in Sana'a and the fighting that we saw at the time on the streets was between two components really of the, the old regime. In 2014, what we saw was a coalition building 
between the Houthis and Saleh. And in 2017, we saw the collapse of, of that coalition eventually to the, the Houthis' benefit. Hadi's problem has been his inability to build coalitions among other players. And the UN has really, the UN process, this two-party process, has really disincentivized the creation of political coalitions to improve bargaining position because Hadi will always be legitimate president and the Houthis will, for the, for the foreseeable future, be the most powerful armed actor. But if we've merged those two tables, my belief, probably wrong, is that we create a situation where everyone's playing on a, a more even footing, where there's a recognition that sort of that table on, on the left is less relevant, although I'm not talking about removing anyone's legitimacy here. And we start creating a position where people realize that if they start working together, they can achieve their, their aims. And that's when people start negotiating in serious ways between themselves. But right now, there's no real motivation for serious deal-making and coalition building. Um, and it also gives the UN oversight and this, this role as a central node in that deal-making rather than distracting itself with this two-party process where the real politics and the real military piece continues on the, the poker table. Sorry if that took a little bit too, too long. No, I think I think that's great. Um, I want to press you on one thing before I ask a question um, on on sort of UN um, security resolution. So I take your point on sort of merging these two tables and, and bringing everybody in. But I wonder if we do that, do we have a situation like we had with the National Dialogue um, Conference in which, and, and we've talked about this, Nedwa I think has brought this up in her paper, Martin Griffiths brought, brought it up. The longer the war goes on, the more armed groups there, there are. So essentially the more players there are that have a seat at the table. And if you're bringing everybody together at, at one table, do you run the risk? Because no one, even though the Houthis are the strongest military power, do you? they aren't able to um, basically exert their control over, over the entire country. So you have a situation where no one is strong enough to make everybody else submit to them. We, and most of these armed groups have enough guys and they have enough guns to act as a spoiler to any sort of deal that they don't like. So do you run the risk by bringing all these and putting them at one table, as you suggest, that if somebody doesn't like the deal, and we, I think we have to remember that at the same time all these armed groups are coming online, Yemen's economic pie is getting smaller and smaller. And so there are less and smaller pieces available for these different armed groups. So do we run the risk of something like the NDC happening again, where the Houthis just up and go home and say, no, we're going to take what we can by, by force, by power? Um, I think you will always run, run that, that risk first and foremost. I would quibble somewhat with the idea that that was purely a function of the, the NDC. And maybe we can discuss what the NDC was and wasn't in, in everyone's view later, later on. But I, I think this again assumes that we're moving very quickly towards one big deal. Um, and I think that's where, to my mind, sort of that, that would be the strategic error. If the idea is let's get everyone to sit in a room for two or three months or six months or nine months, work out a deal as quickly as possible, everyone goes home bish bosh, jobs are good in, then I, I think we're in trouble. If the idea is to create cooperative agreements between the principal, not just military players, but political players, civil society, so on and so forth, that takes that kind of military equilibrium and shifts it from military competition to political competition and, and negotiation, I think we have a chance over a long period of time of moving towards something more sustainable um, and less difficult for ordinary Yemenis. But if the idea is that we're gonna have a grand bargain within three months, which is definitely the, the instinct of international players, they wanna have something really neat, put a bow on it and then, then walk away, then that probably does, as, as you suggest, push us towards re renewed conflict. And the NDC is maybe a, a good example of, of that, but I'd, I'd quibble with kind of the idea that the NDC was the, the whole game at that point. 
Yeah, and that's a that's a great point on, and I think it's the point that Nedwa made as well for the international community. When you rush toward a deal like the Stockholm Agreement with regards to Hudeda, often you get into a situation that you didn't necessarily anticipate. In in Stockholm, it was um, not really defining what local security forces meant, which was a loophole that the Houthis then used to turn Hudeda from one group of Houthis over to another. Um, we're going to sort of shift right now and broaden this conversation a bit. One of the questions I had, which is also a question that's popped up in the Q&A, and this is a question that is talked about a lot every time there's a new special envoy. Again, we're on our fourth one now in Yemen. Um, this comes up. Peter, you mentioned, um, and Nedwa and Mesa, you both have mentioned as well in different ways that the reality now in 2021 is not what the reality was in 2015 when the war started. However, the governing UN Security Council resolution, resolution 2216, is from April of 2015. Uh, most observers see this as being very um, tilted against the Houthis. It essentially calls for their unilateral disarmament and surrender. And so I'd like to start with Nedwa and then go to Mesa and then and then Peter um, and ask, do, is it time for a new UN Security Council resolution? Is 2216 now doing more harm than good? And if it is time for a new resolution, what should that new resolution look like? Basically, what does the Security Council need to do to strengthen the bargaining position of the new UN Special Envoy, to strengthen his hand as, as much as possible? So we'll go to Nedwa first. Okay, so my position is we have resolutions and we have agreements and they're all end up, you know, on paper, basically. I'm not sure... Um, I'm not opposed to changing the UN resolution. I just, I'm not sure it's going to do anything uh, because the bargaining happens on the ground using military force and the UN and the international community do not have tools in place to hold people accountable for their actions. That's the problem. Um, I think there is enough in the UN, in the current resolution to uh, broaden the, the talks and include other, you know, other voices. Uh, but again, you know, I, I'm just not sure it's, it's going to do anything to change the resolution. I mean, sure, tick that box, but I don't think it will lead to anything. Substantial. But, but Nedwa, there is, there is accountability, or at least there's, there's accountability perhaps poorly applied with regards to there's a UN sanctions program. This is the, obviously the sanctions have only targeted the Houthis, have only targeted um, Ali Abdullah Saleh and his eldest son. If, yeah. Is this something that if the UN sanctions were expanded, and there are certainly people on the pro-government or at least anti-Houthi side who meet the designation criteria for the UN Security Council. If the UN Security Council were to sort of sanction one person on the anti-Houthi side, would that send strong a, a strong message that there was some accountability for things that were taking place on the ground? Um, I guess it might make them feel uncomfortable, um, but hold them accountable, I'm not sure. I mean, if we look at the Houthi side, the Salehs as well, what did sanctions do? Nothing much. I mean, Saleh still had all the money. He didn't, you know, give, back that, give that money back to the Yemenis. Why would Abdel Malik al Houthi, who lives in, I don't know, some, um, you know, unknown place in the Yemen mountains care about sanctions, you know? There is there there are ways to get around sanctions, and I think these people have learned and you know made uh, arrangements to get around sanctions. So I don't think sanctions are enough. Uh, and in this particular case, um, there sanctions are not enough uh, to discourage people from certain actions because negotiations happen using violent tools, not you know not political bargaining. That's, that's fair and a good point. Mesa, I'll turn to you. Does the UN need a new resolution? Is the one from April 2015 so out of date that it's um, doing more harm than good at this point? Definitely this resolution is not realistic anymore. Uh, but I have to say it's not important also. I mean, in the practical level, no one is talking now about this UN, UN resolution as a reference except some people in the government and no one is dealing with them seriously. 
So I don't think it's really important because no one is talking now about submitting the weapons to the state as the UN resolution said. And if you change this, the UN resolution, will, you will not change the facts on the ground. The facts on the ground, this is the most important thing. This is the real important thing that, it, that you can build upon it. But the UN resolution, if you want to change it, you can do some pressure on the states, not non-state actors like the Houthis, for example. But it can do some pressure. I mean, the international community has many tools to, to, to do some pressure on the states, on the Saudi Arabia and the UN, United Arab Emirates, or any state, or even in the international recognized government, but not on the Houthis. For example, when you do some, uh, when you uh, impose some sensations on the Houthis, when you talk about some Houthi individuals, like military individuals, they don't have accounts, bank accounts. Their power is not from the bank accounts. They didn't travel in Yemen from outside, to outside Yemen. They don't have any connections outside Yemen. So it's useless actually to do any sensations on them. So I don't think the UN resolution is really something important to concern on it. Uh, so I, it's either you change it or keep it, it's fine. The most important, what is in the ground? That's, that's a good point. Um, Peter, I'm gonna ask you a slightly different question. So <laughs> based on what Mesa and Nedwa have said, that it doesn't really matter. But let's assume that we're in a world right now in which the UN Security Council decides, look, this resolution is old. We have a new special envoy coming in. Yes, the next resolution isn't up for renewal until February of 2022, but let's just, let's write a new one. And I know the International Crisis Group often gives um, counsel to um, different states, to different international bodies. So what if the UN Security Council were to make a new UN resolution, what, what should that look like to give the new, the incoming UN Special Envoy the strongest possible hand in carrying out his mission in Yemen? What are, are there any things that you would argue would be something that absolutely must go in a, a new UN resolution? Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm trying to think about how best to answer that. We've obviously had this conversation with people in DC, with, with member states. Um, and my view, our view right now is if you don't know what the process is going to be and you're hopeful that this new envoy might shift the approach, then it's almost a bad idea to issue a, a resolution right now. And of course, within the council, I mean, we talk about resolutions as if they're the only things. There are press statements, there are presidential statements. Um, and I think more than anything, what we need for this, this new envoy is to see the council give that person the political space and the sort of physical time needed to go talk really seriously and in depth with as, as wide a range of Yemeni groups as is humanly possible, begin to form his own ideas and then consult internationally uh, as well, and then move towards, again, an articulation of maybe a vision is too grand a word, but sort of a, a general sense of this is what a political process looks like. This is our view on things. And if there is a sense that he needs a new security council resolution or presidential statement to firm up his mandate, that would be the right time to do it. But I think to sort of the, the resolution is problematic in its interpretation and in the way that sort of realistically the government, the, the Saudis and others have used it. In my view, it's not about this question of demanding the Houthis surrender anymore, but to, to maintain an exclusionary status quo within the, the negotiation framework. And in fact, if you read the, the resolution, as Nadwa says, it talks a lot actually about inclusion and it recalls other council statements that are very clear in calling for a national political resolution that meets the aspirations of all Yemenis and involves wide ranging political consultations, talks, di dialogues, so on and so forth. So all the, 
all the stuff is there for a new envoy to go and and change the the approach to to rethink the way that the, this job is done. And a Security Council resolution becomes pertinent and important if people say, "Oh, that's not within his his mandate." To my view, so let's not put the the cart before the the horse here. I think. That's fair. Let's let's shift and let's talk about the Houthis because this has come up in, in I think two of the initial statements we saw in in February of 2021. Well, actually, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to January and the last day of the Trump administration when the U.S. designated the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization. A lot of people, including I think some members on this panel, wrote um, strongly worded op eds um, opposing that that decision. That was later reversed by the Biden administration. The Biden administration appointed a U.S. special envoy, Timothy Linder King, um, to work with the UN special envoy to go and, and to try to bring about a ceasefire and eventually some sort of a peace. What we've seen since February, though, is that, and I think Nedwa, you mentioned this, Mesa, you did as well, I believe, is that the U.S. has a lot of leverage with Hattie's government, with Saudi Arabia, to a certain degree with UAE, but it does not appear to have much, if any, leverage with the Houthis. And so my question for all three of you is what can the international community, what can the UN special envoy, what can the US special envoy do to convince the Houthis to negotiate in, in good faith? Um, we've seen that six years of war, at least six years of airstrikes, I should say, has not done much to convince the Houthis to come to the bargaining table. And holding out a variety of different carrots has not really worked so far. The U.S. has now been reduced, the State Department spokesperson, to making a number of um, statements basically saying that um, the Houthis are not being helpful toward the peace process and, and a variety of um, diplomatic language. But what, what can the international community, what can the U.N. Special Envoy, what can the U.S. Special Envoy do to convince the Houthis to sit down at the negotiating table and actually negotiate in, in good faith. We'll, we'll start with Nedwa and, and then, then go to Mesa again. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody can do anything to convince the Houthis to change ways um, and come to the negotiation table in good faith. What I think could be done is build the leverage against the Houthis. Um, and that can be done politically and it can be done militarily. Um, one of the things I think is that's very important, and, and Peter talked about that, um, Mesa too, is that the anti-Houthi camp is very fractured. Um, and so it's important to unite this camp. And the only power that has leverage on all these parties and can bring them together is the Saudis. But I think the Saudis are incompetent to do that either they're unwilling or they like the vision or they're incompetent or they need help to do that. Uh, so I think that's one area um, that could, you know, that could help because if you bring these forces politically, uh, unite them against the Houthis in the negotiations, then I, I don't think that's something that the UN can do because the UN cannot, you know, cannot work with one side, you know, against the other. Uh, but I think, I think that these forces need to be united so that they have a more, you know, stronger voice against the Houthis. Um, and I know there is no appetite for any military action, but ideally, ideally, the Houthis need to be weakened militarily. That will bring the leverage needed on them um, to kind of get concessions. Because you know, people don't agree to you know to political settlement or concessions unless the alternative for them is to lose power. Right now, you know, the best alternative for Houthis is to keep pressing because, you know, they have something to lose if they give concessions. But if they have something to gain when in, to, to give concessions, then, they're, then, then they might be, you know, they might be more willing to, um, to compromise. So if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, Nedwa, whatever the UN Special Envoy does, whatever the US Special Envoy does, whatever the international community, whatever they attempt to do, short of stopping the Houthis in modern, say, for, for instance, it's not going to work. The Houthis have to be stopped militarily before they'll be willing to sit down and negotiate and come to any sort of an agreement. Absolutely. And I, I don't think it, it, it should be short to only stopping Houthis from entering Marib because that also is risky. 
because Houthis can intermarry. You can defend a big city like that by being on the defensive. There has to be an offensive to push the Houthis far enough where there are no, where one, where there are no, um, there are no, um, you know, the threat to Marib, but also where they feel that they can lose more militarily if they don't accept a political concession, a political, a political settlement or some sort of a concession, a uh, compromise. Whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know, but that's, in my opinion, that's the solution. Or, so, that, or that can open windows for a solution. That, that's an interesting point. It doesn't seem to be one that the international community is, is taking at this point. Uh, Mesa, let me ask you this, and, and sort of building on how do you get leverage over, over the Houthis, I think Nedwa brought up an interesting point that Saudi Arabia is really important. I've heard other people, Ambassador Firestein, who, who was there in Yemen previously, has said things like this, which is basically the Houthis know where it is that they live. That is, the Houthis know that their neighbor is Saudi Arabia and know that whatever happens, they're going to have to have some sort of relationship on the border. The Houthis, of course, are from Saada, right on the border with Saudi Arabia. And let me add a, a second part to this with regards to sort of the regional situation. So one of the questions that's popped up in the Q&A is what support does Iran actually give to the Houthis? And I think this is something that often gets talked about. Are the Houthis an ally of Iran? Are the Houthis a proxy of Iran? How much control do, does Iran actually have over the Houthis? And so just to put a little bit of a different spin on the same question, would Tehran, would Iran be able to convince the Houthis to sit down and negotiate in, in good faith if Iran viewed that it was in its own best interest with things that we've seen recently, such as the Baghdad talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia, or part of the Vienna talks with, with Iran and, and potentially renegotiating a new JCPOA. So if you could talk about what support Iran actually does give to the Houthis, how essential that support is, and then is Iran actually an effective um, lever over the Houthis? That is, can Iran convince the Houthis to sit down and negotiate? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I have to say it's, um, it, you say if Iran, and um, I think it's a big if. <laughs> because this conflict is very far from Iran and it didn't cost Iran anything. It doesn't cost Iran anything. In the time, it's a good investment for the Iranian. Uh, they benefit a lot from this conflict. It exhausts the Saudis more than anything else. Uh, so I think, what is the reason that make Iranian do some pressure on the Houthis? This is the first question. And um, the other question about the Houthis, if they are proxy or they are not, I have to say they have a deep rooted in the Yemeni history, I mean, many Yemenis, and I think that they, they believe that they are a sort of continuous of the imama that was ended in Yemen after the Republican Revolution in 1962. So, and this imama controlled Yemen for hundreds of years. So they believe they are a continuous of this um, kind of ruling, and uh, this gives them some a kind of legitimacy, or they believe that they are the only legitimate people who can who rule, should rule Yemen. So there is a kind of historical complexities that it is difficult to be ignored. And um, but I have to say that the Iranian influence in the Houthis has been growing during this war a lot. And um, when Abdel Malik al Houthi took his decision, especially the big decisions about peace and war. He always took his consultancy from the military wing. He always trusts the military wing. This is because of his background. His background was military. He never practiced politics like his uh, big brother, who's uh, Hassan al-Houthi, who's the founder of the Houthi group. So he never practiced politics. So his, military, his background is totally military. And he believed that those the people who are fighting on the front lines, and they, he trusts them more than others. And the military wing received his training from in Iran, the big most of them, especially the leaders. And those leaders, will, and they are very ideologized. I mean, they are very radical group. So when he took his decisions, mainly he took, he took it based on what the military wing will say to him. 
For example, now I believe this military wing, okay, he said to, to Abdel Malik Houthi, let's us, give us time so we can talk over Marib and then we can talk about ending the war. So he took his uh, opinion or he, he built his opinion based on the military wing, in the calculations of the military wing, and it's very difficult to change that. And the Houthi making decision process is very centralized, it's very personalized, and it's about Abdel Malik al Houthi only. So if Abdel, if Abdel Malik al Houthi took his position or took his opinion from the military wing, so it's, we can say from this military wing, the Iranian influence came. The Iranian influence came from the military wing, which this military wing received its military training and received most of the support from the Iranians. So the Iranian influence has been growing inside, inside the Houthi group since the war started, this one point that we have to consider. And another thing that the, the Houthis, because of this historical complexity, they believe that they have a right to rule Yemen. A hysterical right to rule Yemen. Uh, so this is another complexity which is difficult to change. Um, so I'm not very optimistic on this side. Uh, I don't know. I feel that uh, I, I feel that I'm saying it's deadlock. <laughs> That's well. I, I want to ask you one thing. So in in September of 2014, when the Houthis were set to go into Sanaa. Um, I think there's been some reporting on this, the National Security Council in the U.S. leaked to that. There was some, that Iran basically told the Houthis not to go into Sana'a, and the Houthis went in anyways. And so that's in 2014. But of course, a lot has changed, as you've mentioned, it, over the intervening seven years. That is that the Houthis put a, an ambassador in Tehran. Um, Iran has reciprocated. There's an Iranian ambassador, which has now been sanctioned by the, by the United States, who, who is in Sana'a as well. And so I wonder if you could, if, basically, if, if the war continues to go on, and I think a lot of academic literature on civil wars say that civil wars last on average about 10 years. So if, if Yemen is an average war, I'm not so sure it is, but, it, but let's, for the sake of argument, say that it is. And there are three years left of this war. What does the Houthi, and we've seen the Houthi-Iranian relationship change and evolve, basically the Houthis in Iran growing closer and closer over time, which is a little ironic since Saudi Arabia, of course, part of their expressed rationale for going into Yemen was to prevent uh, the Houthis from getting close to Iran. This has been a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if we had three more years of this war, what does the Houthi-Iranian relationship look like? And at that point, is it really, or even at this point, is it possible to disentangle the Houthi-Iranian relationship and sort of peel the Houthis away from Iran? I think in 2014, still the Iranian influence much weaker than now, much weaker. And they, I believe that the Iranian at that time, they were not very confident that the Houthis can manage if they can talk over Sana'a. And this could uh, lead to a war, a civil war inside the country. So they advised them to not take Sana'a or just force them an agreement. It's something similar to situation in Lebanon when Hezbollah is, is the real power who control the country, but it's not the one who control the country at the same time. So I think the Iranian, they want the Houthis at that time to play this role. But the Houthis, because based on what they believe, their legacy, their historical legacy, they believe that they have to take over Sana'a. And for any Zaydi power, and they are Zaydi power, for them Sana'a is a very essential to prove themselves as a Zaydi power. So I believe that they have to take it. At that time, it was their calculations. It's the Houthi calculation, it's not Iranian one. But now the Iranian, they believe that the Houthis, they are really that they are a really strong ally and they can, um, and they are a reliable ally and they are a strong ally that they can rely on them. So I think that they believe now that Houthi is more important for them to abandon them. It was easy to abandon the Houthi in 2014, but now after all of this investment, 
after how they feel that the Houthis they succeeded in controlling these areas and managing this war at the same time. So they believe that they are a winning part that they should not abandon them. And the Houthis, after this war, they believe that because of the ideological similarities, it's political ideological, I mean, they are not the same sect. Uh, so they believe that they have to keep themselves, to maintain themselves in the acts of resistance with the Iranian. It's more, I mean, it's, it's for them more safe than being leg with the Saudis and another leg with the Iranian. It's very difficult for them to manage that situation. So I think it's very, it's too late to say the Houthis can um, reduce uh, the level of uh, their relationship with the Iranian and resume an, or do a, 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 or establish a good relationship with the Saudis. It's very too late. I don't know if the Saudis have any economic incentive for the Houthis. And the Saudis, they have a really big network inside Yemen. In the south and north and everywhere, they have a tribal network. They have a big network, actually. But they lose it by the time. And they don't even manage. I think the bad planning and the bad managing of this war from the Saudis cost Yemen a lot. Because if you can manage this war, if you can plan, if you have any plan, any, any clear plan, if, whether it's good plan for the Yemen interest or bad plan for the Yemen interest, but at least it's much better than that doesn't have plan. So I think this is the problem with the Saudis. It's not, it's more, yeah, I mean the Saudis, their problem that what they want from this war and what's their plan. This is the main question. And the Saudis should answer it if they want to end this war. That's a, that's a good point. Thanks for that. Um, Peter, I'm going to turn to you and, and again put a slightly different spin on, on the same question, which is Nedwa talked a lot that absent any sort of military halting of the Houthi offensive, both in Marib and in other places, absent any sort of weakening of the Houthis militarily, they're probably not going to sit down um, for and, and negotiate in good faith. So my question is really in, in two parts. So one, how essential is Marib to the Houthis? Do the Houthis see themselves as needing to be an independent state and for that needing to control some of the oil and gas fields in Marib? And is this what's really driving the offensive out in Marib? That is, do the Houthis see for their long-term um, sustainability to be able to survive as any sort of an independent state in the north that they absolutely have to have Marib because of that? That's the first part. The second part is, what do the Houthis want? What is an acceptable arrangement for the Houthis? We know that they talk about reopening the Sana'a airport and, and, uh, and um, the port in Hudaydah, allowing for flights and so forth. But is this going to be something like what we've seen in the past where the Houthis hold out their hand, you put something in it, they put it in their pocket, and then, then they say, okay, what's next? What, what do the Houthis want? What's an acceptable arrangement for the Houthis right now in July of 2021? Sure. Um, so two really easy questions. Thanks very much, uh, Craig. Um, uh, on, on the value of Marib, um, the, the more I, I think about it, the more I talk to people in Marib, the more I talk to people in, in Sanaa, the more you see how it, in many ways is the final piece um, for any authority in, in Sanaa, but for the Houthis in, in particular, in effectively reconstituting the pre-1990 Yemeni state, one, and driving another round of bloodletting among their rivals, while at the same time massively diminishing um, the, the sort of credibility of the Hadi government. So one, you've got uh, a refinery, you've got a power plant, which people often forget, which generates that tristium was connected to Sana'a, and two, you've got these oil fields, which are attached to a pipeline that used to export via um, a, a small oil export terminal to the north of, of Hadeda, which has become the, the center of a lot of attention because it's basically built out of a, a rusty old tanker that could just dissolve and fall into the sea at any given moment. But if you're the, the Houthis and you've got all these people in Sana'a, and let's not forget that they 
they really did take over the country's institutions at the beginning of the war, then they can basically do the math on how much money they get, how they solve a lot of their fuel problems, how they can generate electricity and look like a better governance actor, and how they can, I think in their view, rebuild this, this pipeline and get the oil going out via their export terminal. So they effectively have kind of a mini state. The 1990 um, pre-unity Yemen is then under their control, minus Tyre City. At the same time, they're taking something away from the government. They're taking away its last major um, stronghold in Yemen's sort of political geographic north. Um, they're taking away this money and this resource. And they're also taking away the, the one area under nominal government control that is relatively well governed. And then there's these cascading effects in the rest of the country where the STC, the Southern Transitional Council, we haven't spoken about that much, who control Aden, uh, Lahej, or Laheg if you're from around those parts, and Adala um, and Western Abyan have really been, it appears, sitting and waiting for Marab to fall to really push um, for a takeover of Abyan and Shepwa, which are under nominal government control, and to expand their, their authority over um, at least coastal Hadramat. So if the Houthis take Marab, it isn't just this question of, you know, government troops flew to flee to X, Y, and Z place and the humanitarian consequences are terrible. It's also that it has this domino effect of effectively incentivizing another round of fighting among the Houthis' rivals, which has been sort of central to weakening things. Hadi and the government and the Saudis look terrible. International pressure, particularly from certain parts of the progressive left in the US, probably would grow to just kind of cut a deal and, and end this thing. So I think there's just sort of many, many incentives for the Houthis to want to take Marab. Um, and maybe we can discuss Hadeda Port and its significance some other time. But I think that sort of that's become increasingly a red herring a kind of MacGuffin um, in, in the Yemeni war and, and is kind of actually sort of distracting and allows people to misdirect. What do the Houthis want? I think I've been saying for a number of years that I don't think the Houthis know what they want. Um, but I'll, I'll give you one quick anecdote and, and then I'll, I'll hand back to, to the, the panel um, and to Q&A. Um, in 2014, January 2014, I was in Sada with the Houthis um, with a, a group of guys. And one of them kept on telling me, you know, we're going to take over Yemen. We're going to go to Mecca. Then we're going to go to Jerusalem. Um, and I'd be like, guys, come on, let, let's be serious. That you know, these are the, the limits of your ambitions. Maybe you can be part of a, a government in, in Sana'a. And they kind of, you know, were like, what's wrong with this guy? And, and we, we talk about it a lot. And I talked to that group um, continually since then. And one of these guys keeps on saying to me, you know, do you remember when you were in Sada and you said that the limits of our ambition should be sort of a seat in the government in Sana'a? And you laughed at us when we said we were going to take over the country and go to Mecca and Jerusalem. Um, and that really gives me pause because I think, yes, that there's a, a pragmatic political wing, or I mean, more pragmatic, and we can debate that as well. But the military wing, as the guys say, are in the driving seat because they're producing the successes. And I think that the ambitions, the, the real ambitions of the group have grown to match their, their sort of overall successes. And if you're the Houthis, 17 years ago, you were kind of a few dozen guys getting your head kicked in, in Sada. Now you control most of the pre-1990 Yemen. You're pushing militarily into parts of southwestern Saudi Arabia. And in your view, sort of this Zionist American Saudi regional conspiracy, I'm not saying that's a real thing. I'm just saying that's sort of the, the Houthis view of the, the world has basically been, been defeated. So of course, at this point in time, ambitions are gonna be are gonna be sky high and probably growing. Um, and I'm not sure that sort of because of the makeup of the movement and the way it makes decisions, I'm not sure anyone really has a strong sense of strategically, you know, one year we're gonna do this, this, and this. But as long as they keep on winning in, in their view, they're going to believe that sort of, you know, God's on their, their side and, and that they can keep on pushing towards these wider macro goals, which from a regional geopolitical perspective is, is quite, quite, is deeply worrying. And from, from the perspective of trying to sort of foster peace in, in Yemen is, is highly challenging. 
Right. So if you're if you're talking with a group that doesn't quite know what it wants, but always wants a little more than it has, it's really, really difficult to make a deal with them. Um, OK, so let's there have been a number of questions in the Q&A that sort of get to at this question that I'm about to ask. And it's one that I think is sort of one of the key questions. And there are a lot of different iterations, but basically it's can Yemen be reconstituted as a single state this deep into the war? Is that even possible? And if it's not possible, what does what does the geography that we know of as Yemen, what does that look like in 2023, in 2024? Are we talking about a breaking up of the state to look like pre-1990 in North Yemen under Houthi control, a South Yemen under the STC, Hadi, Tariq Saleh, some combination therefore, although getting these, um, as the Riyadh agreement has shown, getting these different actors to work together. Is that even possible? Does Yemen look more like Somalia? Does it just fracture into these areas that are held by whatever particular warlord or armed group is strongest in any particular area? So I'd love, we only have about um, 13 minutes or so left in the event, but I'd love to get all of you to answer this. And Nedwa, I'm going to come to you first, but I'm also going to sneak in a second question, um, which has come up in the Q&A, which is really important as well. And that's on the role of tribes. You've written a lot about tribes over the past several years. Has tribal power, I mean, we've seen people like um, with Hashid, for instance, uh, Mujahid Abu Shuareb, Sheikh Abdullah Lahmar, these old men of Hashid have died on. And certainly with Sheikh Abdullah and even with uh, Mujahid's sons, they have not really been able to inherit the mantle of their father. So what's the role of Hashid, Vakil, of these different tribes, particularly in the north, under a, under a Houthi state, if, if that is? So um, I'll, I'll smuggle that second question in and, and turn to you. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's really, really hard to anticipate what's going to happen to Yemen. I, you know, given the current conditions and the various forces and the overlapping, you know, um, overlapping powers and interests and, you know, divergent agendas and all of that, um, I don't think we will see a unified Yemen um, in the future. We, but we will, we will definitely not see a central government in Sana'a that will control all Yemen. That's a thing of the past. That's never going to happen again. So I think it's, you know, in everybody's interest, it's important that people come to peace with this. Um, I think what we have now is a form, people like to call it fragmentation. I like to call it a form of a de facto decentralization. We have Marib, we have Shabwa, we have Hadramaut, we have areas that are running their affairs, okay? Uh, with little involvement from the uh, Yemeni government that's outside Houthi control. Um, but even, we don't, I don't think we will, we will go to like a North and South um, and then let others talk about this because even within the South, there are tensions and conflicts between different, you know, actors and different um, power brokers. Um, in terms of the tribes, the tribes have been fundamental critical, essential uh, in maintaining order and security um, and resolving conflicts, uh, especially given the collapse of the government and government and institutions uh, and the increasing conflicts. And I did write a report that was published last month uh, by the Middle Eastern Institute on tribes and de-escalation and ceasefire mechanisms. Um, and I'll share it uh, in the chat um, function later. Um, in the North, so what's... So, so they, they continue to do that, but in the north, it's it's a little different uh, under free control because under Saleh, uh, the tribes have enjoyed uh, a level of autonomy, but also a cooperative relationship with the government. There was there was a, a great deal of understanding between the the regime in Sanaa and the tribes, um, but the Houthis, one of the pillars of Houthis governing system if you want to call it like that, is dismantling the tribal structure because the Houthis view the tribes as a threat. So what they're doing is trying to um, use different tools, including co-optation, but also more uh, suppression um, to, uh, to kind of uh, dismantle the tribal structure where it becomes subordinate to the Houthis. Um, 
And they've done that using several ways. So I think it, I think in areas that are controlled by the Houthis, it will only be a matter of time before we see that tribal structure collapse. Um, and that helps the Houthis exert you know, complete control over the society because during Saleh, the tribes have actually protected their own, their own citizens, their own you know, tribesmen from government uh, you know, uh, abuse. Uh, so they, they also have that kind of function. Um, I, I, you know, giving the conflicts everywhere and, you know, I feel like this is going to be our reality for a while. I, I do one of my greatest fears, actually, it, it is my greatest fear that the tribal system will eventually collapse. Um, and with that, you know, 90%, the system that resolves 90% of the conflicts and that, uh, pretty much provides security throughout you know, Yemen, particularly, you know, outside cities uh, will collapse. And that would be, a, that would be a disaster because the alternative is chaos. So I'm going to turn to Mesa um, and, and ask you to sort of put on, you know, look into your, into your crystal ball and tell us a little bit about the future. In the past six and a half years of war in Yemen, what, what states, what states, what does Yemen look like when this war ends? What does Yemen look like? Um, two states, one state, a lot of states. If it's a lot of states, are these fractured or fragmented or what Ned would call decentralization? How do any of them function economically when you have Marib, Shebwa, and Hadramut that have the lion's share of the natural resources? All of these governments have to some degree um, been able to have a, a degree of autonomy and are receiving directly some of those some of those profits. So, so Mesa, what to, tell us what the future looks like. Oh, and I'll give you uh, four minutes. Okay, I don't think that Yemen could be a united state. Uh, definitely not centralized state, not anymore. Uh, but um, I will not be optimistic that it is a kind of decentralizing the Yemeni state. It's actually it's. It's a kind of fragmentation, I have to say. We can't divide Yemen two states. Not uh, not like it's it's not a situation like it was in 1990. Um, all the local governance uh, examples that we talk about, it they have a kind of wealth. Shabwa, Marib, Hadramaut. It's not the case with other uh, areas. For example, Taiz. Uh, for example, other areas that doesn't have um, any wealth. It's very difficult for them to manage. So I don't know. The situation look very chaotic outside of the Houthi controlled areas. And it's very gloomy inside the Houthi areas. <laughs> so I don't I, I can't imagine what after six, seven years, it depends what the Saudis are going to do. Also, look to the scenario of Taliban in Afghanistan, for example, the Houthis is still the strongest military power inside the local, strongest local military power inside Yemen. And if there is no external power can stop them, they can actually took over all of Yemen military-wise, military-wise, but they can't control more than their areas. This is the thing that the Houthis never think of it. The Houthis, they are controlling now the Zaidi areas, Adding to this, Ib and Al Hudaydah and Ib Al Hudaydah, they are very easy societies. They are not tribal societies. They are unlike the southern society, which is which has a lot of resentment against Sana'a, also Taiz. So, I think this could be a trap if they went to that direction. If they went to try to expand their military, uh, their military presence or their military ruling. Especially, for example, they are thinking that they can talk over uh, Marib military wise, they can do it, but they can't control Marib. They will never do it because the resistance, the social resistance against them will be very difficult for them to manage with it. So um, I, I think the Houthis, they can't expand more than they have now, although they believe they can go to Mecca, to Jerusalem, and they believe that actually. And, um, mostly the mo first generation of this kind of movement, they are very ambitious. Then the second generation, they will be more realistic. <laughs> so maybe we need time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Peter, I'm going to give you the last word, um, and you have about three minutes. And basically, my question to you, it's it, again, it's 
the version of what Nedwa and Mesa talked about, and we heard um, not very optimistic takes from both of them. That is the idea of a, of a centralized, single, unitary state coming back. It, that ship has probably sailed. But we see the UN Special Envoy is still working toward that goal. Um, the U.S., that's still the stated position of the, of the U.S. Special Envoy as well. My question is, given the, the realities on the ground, should the U.N., should the international community basically cut its losses and say, look, at this point, trying to reconstitute Yemen as a single state is not going to happen in order to prevent chaos, fragmentation, um, political decentralization, where you have these different warlords in different areas, many of whom are supported by outside and or regional powers, should we cut our losses and just try to find some way to make two states out of Yemen? Because two states for the international system seems workable. Seven, eight, nine little statelets is not. So if the unitary state is not coming back, and the nightmare scenario is a lot of little statements that are fragmented and controlled by warlords. Should the UN Special Envoy, the US and the international community now just start working to find a way to create a Houthi state in the north and an STC Hadi Tariq Saleh state in the south? And you have about two and a half, three minutes. And if you have any other thoughts on what Yemen will look like in the future, um, we'd love to hear them. There you go. Sure. Um, thank you for, for the question. I mean, I, I think we're all in agreement. The Yemen of a decade plus ago, we're not going to go back to. Um, and the illusion that that's a, a possibility is increasingly a, a dangerous one because it takes us down policy paths that might make sense from, from Washington or, or London or, or Brussels, um, but in, in reality, probably actually sort of promote more more war and deeper fragmentation of of the state but then you come to sort of the the counter um of of that which is also kind of a risky business which is predicting the final sort of status on on the ground um and trying to sort of think ahead and predetermine what yemen should look like as as a state and as messy as it is that's gonna have to be to an extent, a Yemeni Yemeni process, um, an attempt to preempt and kind of shape Yemen um, into a set of structures that the international community, quote unquote, thinks suits its interests, is probably a non-starter. It's probably a losing game from from the south. And again, I mean, just coming back to this this point that I've, I've made several times, it also fits into this idea that there. Uh, and it's very hard to make this argument when we're talking about policy, but the idea that you should start with sort of your end goals as the US or the UN or whoever, and then reverse engineering near a complex situation like Yemen's to fit into your end goals is, is really risky. Um, so I, I'd say some kind of process that deals with and to an extent acknowledges de facto realities on the ground finds a way to stop the fighting, allow trade and people to move relatively freely within Yemen's geographic boundaries and creates political cooperation, conversation, debate and, and dialogue, which would of course be accompanied by lots and lots of violence, assassinations, all sorts of, of not very nice things uh, at all, while trying to sort of steer people towards ending this thing and finding a sustainable solution through through dialogue sounds fantastical in in many ways but it's still probably the the least bad option of of all but kind of deciding in washington that okay yemen should be two or three things and would we'll, that'll make our, our life easier would probably end up looking quite short-sighted and would also leave a lot of people in yemen feeling pretty disenfranchised, I, I think, especially if you're from sort of the, the political geography of the north of Yemen, and you have moved outside the country, or you've moved into an area that is not yours, you're not going to live in an SCC dominated Aden, and you won't be able to return to, to Sana'a. And maybe that's sort of reality for a lot of people. And that would be incredibly sad if it, it were, but you'll find there's going to be a lot of um, internal political and military resistance to any any policy like that. So I, I think it's it's better to kind of 
build a better picture of realities on the ground, deal with those realities without legitimizing or accidentally kind of solidifying anybody's position and try and see what we can achieve through through political dialogue. And some will say, well, aren't you just trying to reconstitute the national dialogue? And that failed and there was a, a civil war. But what's interesting today, and I'll leave this as my, my closing thought, is that during the NDC, power was still held by a small elite in, in Sana'a. And now power has been shifted. So it is actually sort of distributed much more evenly across the, the country. And decisions made by sort of a unity government in Sana'a made up of the old regime um, can't upend um, the, the work of, of sort of a national dialogue like body or some kind of national political dialogue. So in many ways, it's more of a facilitating environment for something like national dialogue of, of some kind than it was in 2012 to, to 2014. But the, the risk factors are even, even higher at the same time. Thanks for that, Peter. And I think this has been a, this has been a deeply informative panel um, for people who follow Yemen closely, for those who are just coming to it um, with sort of a, a more cursory understanding. I think there's a lot. I think what's become clear is that the new UN Special Envoy certainly has his work cut out for him, if indeed um, it, it does turn out to be um, the individual whose name has been, um, been floated in the news. Um, so there is, there's a lot to be done in Yemen, and I think, unfortunately, um, the war is, is not close to, to ending. So um, with that, I, I want to thank all three of the panelists, Nedwa, Mesa, Peter. Um, I thought you all did a fantastic job. I'm going to turn it back over to Raymond, um, who I believe will, will close, us, close us out for the day. Thanks, Craig. Um... And thank you to all the panelists for uh, spending an hour and a half with us uh, and, and dissecting these uh, important issues. We'll continue on our end to focus on, on Yemen and solutions to the conflict there and look forward to engaging with our audience and our speakers again. So thank you all. And please uh, uh, keep checking our website, agsiw.org for updates uh, on upcoming events and analysis. And uh, with that, thank you all again. Thank you, Greg. Thank you to all speakers.